The United Nations reports over a thousand children have been abducted by Nigeria's Boko Haram since 2013. On the eve of her burial, South Africa remembers anti-apartheid activist Winnie Mandela. And Saudi Arabia holds its first ever fashion week with no photographers and no men. Africa 54 starts right now. Good evening and welcome. I'm Vincent McCorry. This is Africa 54. The United Nations says the Boko Haram terrorist group has abducted over 1,000 children in northeast Nigeria over the last five years. On the eve of the fourth anniversary of the abduction of 276 schoolgirls from the town of Chibok, Matthew Lorotunda reports on Nigeria's struggle to contain the militant group that uses kidnappings to spread fear and show power. The United Nations says Nigeria's Islamist insurgency, known as Boko Haram, has kidnapped over 1,000 children since 2013. These girls were released by the group last month for reasons that are still unclear. The government says it paid no ransom. Many of those still in captivity would be used as child soldiers or forced into marriage. Boko Haram, which has ties to Islamic State, is also known to have used some, including girls, as suicide bombers. The UN's report documented only verified cases, the first time it had published such a tally, but it admits the number could actually be much higher. Nigeria's government has reportedly estimated it could be as high as 10,000 if you include neighboring Cameroon. President Muhammadu Buhari rode to power in 2015 promising to deal with Boko Haram. Now, 10 years into its insurgency, there is no sign the conflict is going to end anytime soon. That was Matthew Labrotunda. For more insight on the terror inflicted by Boko Haram, I'm joined in studio by Hafsat Maina Mohammed, uh, VOA House uh, a reporter. Welcome to Africa 54. Thank you very much. Now, you personally come from the north and part of Nigeria and you had to see the ugly face of the terror of Boko Haram. Can you share with us uh, what your experience wo uh, was like uh, living in that part of Nigeria? Okay, um, actually I was going back and forth there even though I'm from the northeastern part of Nigeria. Uh, uh, goes a local government to be precise, which is in the southern part of Brno, very close to Chibok, Bama, and other um, um, local governments that have been had been massacred, you know, through through, through the violence of Boko Haram. But um, yeah, I faced a lot of persecution from Boko Haram themselves, and um, uh, through the work I was doing as a journalist and as an activist trying to help people out there. So it was a tragedy um, when my children got involved, when they were kidnapped and when I was um, facing a lot of death threats, you know, right in my face. Mm -hmm. um, and then when I would see them come to the community and just do whatever they want to do mm -hmm. and leave yeah. like it's okay. Now you say your kids were kidnapped. Mm -hmm. uh, what was the eventual fate of your kids? Um, well, I got them back. I got them back because um, most of the um, young men or young boys, they recruit in Boko Haram. Most of them are boys from our community. They are children we know. They are children we've once helped or helped. So these boys are forced or, you know, brainwashed or whatsoever they do to get them in and they can't come out. So once that boy saw my children, he knew them, he knows them. And, you know, he quickly found a way to get me involved and we finally got my kids back. Now, is it possible, though, that the highly publicized campaign to have the Chibo girls released has in some way uh, somehow um, made people not realize that there's so many uh, hundreds of other children and women who have been kidnapped in this battle. Yes, of the country. I want to agree with that because a lot of times, um, even though it's a sad, sad situation that these girls um, have been kidnapped four years now, but uh, forgetting or not publicizing the other young girls who are still in captive, not necessarily taken by, you know, Chibok or the Dubchi kidnapping or, you know, what kidnapping they gave yeah. a name, 
I mean, there are other innocent girls who were taken just like that from their communities, from their homes. Mm -hmm. I remember before the Chibok girls, there were about 70 girls who were kidnapped from my village. And I remember, you know, working with a lot of mothers, trying to give them trauma counseling on their girls being taken. I remember being a bus where two girls were taken right in front of me, and those girls were schoolgirls. They're young girls. Um, I escaped death. Almost everybody died in the bus. I didn't die because maybe I have a long way to go and the work I was doing. I don't know why, but I see a lot of girls. I, I, a lot of girls have been kidnapped, not necessarily Chibok, Dubchi, Obama, or any name, hmm. but nobody is publicizing that. Nobody's really talking about that, you know. Wow. And that is really sad because somebody, and I dare to say somebody out there is lying. Mm -hmm. Well, so sad, really, of what uh, the girls, the women, and the people of Northeastern Nigeria have to face and what you personally had to go through. We're happy that you're alive and you're here with us. Thank you. And thanks for coming and sharing Thank that so with much. us today. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Well, that's uh, Hafsat uh, Amina Mohammed, uh, who is a VOA House uh, reporter. Now, a plea for forgiveness and an unexpected marriage have brought two Rwandan families together 24 years after the genocide that claimed more than 800,000 people, mostly Tutsis, in Rwanda. VOA reporter Edward Reimer recently visited Rwanda and has the story of how the son of a confessed killer married the daughter of a family who lost relatives at the hands of the father. The village of Buguri is just a few kilometers away from the Rwandan capital, Kigali. It was in this village 24 years ago that Silas Bihizi joined other ethnic Hutus in killing his Tutsi neighbors. Among those murdered was Valens Luchiriza's brother, the man's wife, and their three children. Bihizi was arrested in early 1995 for actions he has come to abhor and spent 13 years in prison. He was released to face a community-based court that included victims, relatives and friends set up to speed prosecutions in the genocide. During the trial, he confessed, asked for forgiveness and was sentenced to 13 years, which was the time already served. Among those who participated, I was among them. That resulted in being accused of killing Rukiri Zavarian's family that included his sister-in-law, children, and his elder brother. After his release, he returned to his wife, their seven children, and his farm work. But he worried about meeting the relatives of his victims, something inevitable in a small village. After my release, I decided that confessing to a crime during trial wasn't enough. Then I decided to go to the home of those that had endured a lot because of my crimes and ask for their forgiveness. I apologized because I wanted to free my soul. Rukiriza, whose brother Bihizi had killed, was the key witness against Bihizi. During the trial, Ruchiriza argued he should be sentenced to life in prison. Forgiving someone who ripped his family apart was difficult, but Ruchiriza decided to pardon him and move forward. We accepted his apology as a family, but of course that wasn't easy. It required a lot of strength. At first I hesitated, and my neighbors can attest to that. I felt I, felt I could not do it, but thanks to God, I had to accept the apology. Our government encourages us to promote unity and reconciliation and to coexist peacefully. A big step came in 2009, two years after his release. His son Stanislas Nyomunjeri approached him with plans to wed Iasent Muraide, Luchiriza's daughter. When he told me that, it felt like he had opened an old wound. Well, I had asked for forgiveness for the crimes I committed, but I couldn't imagine having to face Rukiza again to tell him that my son wanted to marry their daughter. Muraire's father initially resisted too, but the young couple were deeply in love. My fiancé used to tell his friends that if I don't marry that girl, I would commit suicide. He repeated those same threats to my family when we visited them. Then my father asked why he should go through that. 
It is then that I made a decision. Instead of losing him, I would rather stay away from my family if they opposed our marriage. Ruchiriza said he relented and blessed his daughter's marriage because he wanted to support reconciliation. Hating reconciliation is adding a heavy burden on yourself. It leads to a lot of stress. If I had not been courageous enough to accept and forgive, I would be a useless person by now. I wouldn't be the man I am now. I would be a drunkard here. I had that courage, and God helped me through that process. Today, both Ruchiriza's and Bihizi's bloodlines commingle in three young, beloved grandchildren. Well, viewers, Edward Roman now joins me in studio to tell us more about the ongoing journey of healing and reconciliation in Rwanda. Welcome back to Africa 54, Eddie. A fascinating story there. Now, Thank first, you. you were there, you saw this man. How comfortable was it for uh, Bihizi and the in-laws, uh, like uh, the father-in-law of the, the son now, uh, Rukiriza, interacting, talking together, spending time together? Surprisingly, uh it was me that was so nervous <laughs> <More than them. laughs> than, than the two of them. Yeah. Uh, they were friendly. Yeah. Uh, they seemed to, to like each other. Yeah. Uh, these are people who had lived together as neighbors for yeah. so many years. Mm -hmm. uh, I actually asked uh, the uh, confessed killer whether he knew uh, his victims before the genocide and he said yes uh, these were my friends they were my neighbors uh, they used to come home we used to visit them so it was uh, uh, kind of uh, you know unusual yeah you know? it's really inexplicable how this minds was twisted to turn against their immediate neighbors but it's been over 20 years now uh, from your travels across the country, do you get the sense that uh, there are more and more of such levels of uh, forgiveness and reconciliation among the Rwandans? Yeah, this is uh, something that is spearheaded by, by the government through its uh, Unity and Reconciliation Commission. Uh, so many people uh, have been able to overcome uh, that past and try to relate, to live together with the people that uh, uh, killed their families. Uh, again, uh, the government always says, forgive, but don't forget. But again, in most cases, uh, it opens uh, past wounds. Uh, it's so hard for people to relate, uh, given the past history that was uh, terrible. Mm -hmm. But uh, when you talk to government officials, they say that uh, it's a process and uh, it's uh, heading towards a positive Direction. It's really a process. Uh, perhaps uh, as new a new generation comes up, we have now kids who are born after the genocide who are over well, 20, 20 years 20 old. Years. Uh, is that perhaps changing things a little bit? So yeah, that, uh, it, it is changing. Yeah. And uh, uh, most of these kids, because uh, for them they say, we never took part in this. So why should, be, why should we be held hostage of the past? Let's not forget, but again, uh, strive to build a better Rwanda, a mm -hmm. better tomorrow. Very quickly, politically, does it have any serious feasible implications? Uh, well, I, I, I don't see, uh, but again, uh, as you know, uh, other groups, the other groups that still believe that uh, mm -hmm. there was double genocide in Rwanda, yeah. there are those yeah. who don't believe that uh, uh, only Tutsis died, uh, they claim that uh, there are so many other Hutus that died. So mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's a political issue yeah. that is still uh, controversial, but again, uh, without setting that the genocide against the Tutsis happened, uh, it was recognized by the United Nations. Yeah. and. Yeah, it is what it's it is. a long journey for sure, so it's going to take time. We do appreciate very much your coming on to share this story with us Thank and you so much. your perspectives. Well, that's a, a VOA Central Africa reporter, Eddie Rema. Now, the African Africa 54 team is always thrilled when our viewers reach out to us on social media to let us know what you think about us and the stories we cover. We recently asked our, on our social media platforms, what are the challenges girls face in Africa? And we continue to receive a lot of comments. I received a tweet from Joseph Zulu in Zambia who wrote, African girls are most vulnerable. They don't get quality education or good paying jobs and many are raped. 
Uh, Joseph, you are right. In some parts of Africa, girls find themselves in very difficult situations. We regularly cover stories on how girls can be helped uh, to rise above their circumstances. Now, let's go to Orji Echeta Silas from Inugu, Nigeria, who was moved to, uh, by our coverage of Winnie Mandela's legacy and wrote, Winnie Mandela is an inspiration for African women. And it's always very satisfying and encouraging when we get messages like this one from Desmond Campbell in Britain. He wrote, Africa 54, you're doing great work. Thank you, but I would like to see Africa united. Desmond, thank you for your kind remarks. We too would like to see African countries working in harmony. Thank you very much for your comments and please keep them coming. Reach out to us on Facebook at voaafrica.com, uh, rather voaafrica54. And don't forget, we stream our show live every day. Also follow me on Twitter at, excuse me, at VOA Vince McCory. And coming up now, South Africa says goodbye to Winnie Mandela. Stay with us. The main man. South Africans are preparing to say their final goodbyes to anti-apartheid activist Winnie Madikizela Mandela. She will be laid to rest in Johannesburg on Saturday. From all corners of the continent, Africans are speaking out about her influence on their lives. Africa 54's Heidi Adams Fitzpatrick has more. A nation in mourning. Winnie Madikizela Mandela's death has opened old wounds and sparked new debate about her life and what she meant to whom. At a memorial service in Soweto this week, Madikizela Mandela's grandson called out her critics. For those of you who are still trying to drag the name of Umakul, archbishops and chiefs alike, the people are angry, we are hurt, and we will not tolerate your defamatory messages or disrespect. Across the continent, Africans reflect on her activism and how she should be remembered. Winnie's legacy is respect and resilience. Resilience of the African woman and also it extending into the political sphere where it's very difficult for women to work in the political environment and for her to be able to command the respect that she did uh, in the ANC, in South Africa and the world over is something that we all as young women can learn from. You need to stand up for what you believe in. You cannot be afraid of the things that are opposing you, especially when it comes to human rights, especially when it comes to being oppressed, any form of oppression. I think that's what she symbolizes in my life. Elle a fait ce qu'elle a, elle, elle a, elle a pu faire. She did everything and used everything she had to fight against apartheid. We can't talk about Mandela's fight against apartheid and exclude this woman. In my opinion, she is and will remain an icon for all Congolese. In Zimbabwe, rights activist Evan Mawarire hailed Madikizela Mandela as an inspiration to Africa's youth in the fight for justice. She refused to give up her spot to fight for her freedom to someone else. She refused to subcontract the future that she was fighting for to someone else, to an organization. She wanted to be at that table. This is what the generation of freedom seekers and those that fight for justice in our generation must understand. Nobody will do it for us. We must be present ourselves. We must be present on the field of battle. We must be present at the table of negotiation. To some, she's a sinner. To others, she's a saint. As South Africa lays Winnie Madikizela Mandela to rest this weekend, many Africans will be watching and remembering with grief and gratitude. 
Well, Haiti joins me now, and she's been monitoring the ways news coverage on the continent has been unfolding since Mariki Zella Mandela's death. Now, Haiti, uh, what, from your observation, uh, does the African press say about how Winnie should go down in history? Well, you know, Vincent, one thing that's been really easy to spot are these various voices, these different voices in the African press over the past um, week or so about how Winnie should be remembered. Many people coming out and really defending her legacy, saying, you know, um, or really telling these countering stories to the unflattering stories that they've seen in what they say the Western media has been portraying Winnie's life. And so people are coming out to really defend her, many feeling that she's an African icon and that her story should be told from an African point of view. I'm going to show you a few of these op-eds. We can see from this one in the South African edition of the Huffington Post, Winnie wasn't evil, she was remarkable. The East African Review has a scathing op-ed um, called Winnie Mandela and South Africa's Unburied Past of how Western media have really portrayed Winnie as a villain and that history has, for instance, been kinder to figures like Winston Churchill, who many feel had deep contempt for Africans. And so saying ultimately, you know, Winnie refused to compromise on what she stood for and that her spirit could be bent but not broken. Then a really moving tribute in Ghana's daily graphic from former President Jerry Rawlings calling her the bravest of the brave and saying some of those who benefited from her pain and struggle didn't really see their way clear and early enough to give Winnie Madikizela Mandela what was due to her. Nigeria's vanguard had this op-ed, Why Winnie Mandela Matters to Nigerian Women, calling her the most transformational woman in the 20th and 21st century. And one of the most interesting comments that, um, columns uh, rather, that I've seen in the past week was from author Minabera Ibalema from Nigeria saying Winnie Mandela, death of a repentant warrior. And so he talks about how Winnie was really this mirror through which people could see how dehumanizing apartheid really was. And he talks about the fact that, you know, she had this unwholesome side to her activism and that she regretted it. Um, he recalls a speech she had made here in the US at the University of Alabama at Birmingham in which she said the world is a more violent place than when I came into it to the extent that I played a role in bringing that about I am sorry so Vincent really we're seeing this um, different side to the different sides mm -hmm. of Winnie Mandela many of us in South Africa growing up you know we saw this unapologetic woman yeah. who wasn't afraid to fight fire with fire exactly so what a wealth of material in the africans uh, africa's mainstream media but of course we know there is the social media right. Right. component nowadays what are they saying on social media well you know um for many people in south africa winnie madikizela mandela is a historical figure but the discussion that has been going on is really about what is her place in history and so um it's really that that's making her struggle and past pain very current today on Twitter women are using the hashtag black with a duck you know what a duke is, is that a, like it's something on the head they, right uh, that's an uh, duke is an Afrikaans word for a headscarf and yeah, so women cool. have been posting selfies in which they wear a headscarf or, or a beret copying her style with a message she's not dead she has multiplied and then political leaders and Hollywood actors have been using the hashtag Winnie. Idris Elba, for one, who you'll know, he'd met mm. Winnie and he also played Nelson Mandela in the movie Long Walk to Freedom. He tweeted his tribute, rest in peace, Mama Winnie. My heart is heavy right now. You lived a full and important life, contributing to the liberation of a nation by force and actual activism. You will never be forgotten. Mm -hmm. um, one more, Viola Davis tweeting, a woman who epitomized how the power of a woman's love intelligence and vision can change a culture rest in peace Winnie Mandela civil rights activist Reverend Jesse Jackson he's gonna be at the funeral tomorrow he said in the darkest hour of the struggle to free South Africa with Nelson Mandela in prison the face of hope and courage was Winnie Mandela may she forever rest in power various wow. perspectives there Indeed. Winnie Thank Mandela you. Controversial in life and now in death. And in death. Thank you very much. Amazing reporting there and uh, uh, wonderful you. research. Thank, Thank you very you. much, Haiti. And uh, the spew is Haiti Adams Fitzpatrick. It is time now for a short break. Still to come on Africa 54. Fashionably late, Saudi Arabia hosts its first ever fashion week. We'll be right back. Thank you. Portuguese. 
Bensu. Arabic, it is the beat. The African beat that counts. The beat does all the translations. It cuts across all languages and gives us the understanding that this is the African beat. It is so distinct. And adhesive. It binds us together. African beat on the voice of America. For more information, visit our website at www.voanews.com slash African beat. Welcome back to Africa 54, and here's what's trending. Beloved pets can create memories that last a lifetime. This particular dog, however, doesn't need feeding or taking for a walk. He's a robotic toy brought into Ron's care home in the south of England to give residents regular access to a family friend and encourage social interaction. Many of the residents have dementia and dogs, even robotic ones like Biscuit, are a good way to elicit memories and spark conversations with care providers. Despite gaining in popularity in countries like Japan, Robotic therapy pets are yet to be introduced nationally in Western dementia care. Next up, uh, fashionable women, dark-haired Saudis and blonde Eastern Europeans alike fill the halls of Riyadh's Ritz Carlton Hotel, marking the start of Saudi Arabia's first ever fashion week. Strict social restrictions have eased dramatically under Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, yet restrictions persist. Tuesday's reception was open to men and cameras, but only women are permitted at catwalk events and outside photography is barred. Women in public places in Saudi Arabia, the birthplace of Islam, wear abayas, loose fitting full length robes, symbolic of piety. With recent reforms, women in some cities have begun to don more colorful abayas, sometimes trimmed with lace and velvet, or left open to reveal long skirts or jeans. And that's our show for today. Thanks a lot for watching. We we'll leave you now with the music of Senegalese Mahe Sissoko and his wife. Silo, 